Thanks very much for the virtual invitation to speak today. I'll talk to you about clogging and dynamics for active matter in complex environments. And uh, this work has been done in collaboration with Charles Reichardt here at Los Alamos. And here's a picture for those of you who are elsewhere. Okay, let's see if I can get my, there we go. So I'll first describe briefly some active Casimir effects, and then I'll mostly talk about periodic substrates and connecting active matter physics with Mott physics, which is really something more from hard condensed matter. And then talk briefly about uh, the difference between thermal and active clogging and show some future directions. And I'm told that I'm supposed to wait till the five minutes at the end for people in the chat with questions. So I guess hold your questions rather than interrupting. Um, although personally, I like to be interrupted, but so just this is the standard background active matter slide. I think most of the audience here is very familiar with the idea that uh, active particles have got internal rather than external propulsion. I'm having trouble with my mouse here. Uh, there we go. And uh, so there's many examples of different systems that are active that everybody has to show starlings, but you can have fish, you can have them be much smaller like bacteria, or you can have them be a lot bigger like some kind of robot. Um, so of course, uh, here again is the, the different size scale of the active matter and the different types of activity that you can have. We're gonna focus in this talk specifically on run and tumble active particles. So this would be something like E. coli, where it breaks detailed balance by swimming in one direction for some period of time, and then it changes its direction and then runs once again in a single direction. Um, so that's the, there's other types, including driven diffusive, but for most purposes, what I show here would also apply to driven diffusive as well, active matter. And so, of course, because of the breaking of detailed balance, active systems can do things that thermal systems cannot. And in particular, they can induce something called a ratchet effect, where just by having sort of fluctuating motion, you can induce a directional flow. And that would be a violation of the second law of thermodynamics, except these systems don't obey the second law of thermodynamics. So that's acceptable. So here's an example of active particles that are... Uh, that are in a uh, have been have a an obstacle that is asymmetric placed inside there, and they're actually able to get this obstacle to turn. These are bacteria, but you can get a similar effect at a much larger scale. So this is a movie from Volpe's group. If I can get it to play, yeah, I've got so many overlays on my screen right now. There we go. So these are these little hexabugs that you can buy at the toy store. And I guess they've 3D printed a little gear for them to push. And what you see is the trace of where this gear is moving as a function of time. And after a little while, they come and couple to the teeth and they're actually able to push the gear around. So we are extracting work from these little hexabugs. Now you keep seeing hand reaching in there to flip them over when they fall on their back. But um, this shows an example of how you can have what's often considered in uh, much smaller scales like molecular ratchets or much larger scales like mechanical ratchets occurring on this active matter time scale. So we'll go. Now, what are the distinctive properties of active matter? If you just have Thermal particles, which don't break detailed balance, they're going to stay relatively uniform in density as a function of time. But it's well known that with active particles, if you, as you increase their density or you increase the persistence length of their um, breaking of detailed balance, you can get this phase separated state where you go from having relatively uniform density to having one or more giant clusters of very high density surrounded by a gas of low density. And this is a very dynamical state. Uh, this large cluster has a lot of changes and motions inside it. It'll fall apart. It'll come back together. But essentially, as a function of either density or, in this case, Peclet number, or the importance of the, the swimming compared to any other fluctuations like thermal fluctuations, you get this boundary between the more single phase state and the phase separated state. 
So we'll represent that with simulations. As I said, we're actually going to consider the run and tumble particles. And we'll look at a very simple model where the particles are overdamped. So they have no inertia. As soon as you stop pushing on them, they stop moving. Um, and then their velocity is going to be directly proportional to whatever force is acting on them. So the force acting on them, there will be an internal motor force. And this is going to represent the little flagella on the bacteria or whatever other propulsion is occurring in the particular active matter system you want to model. Um, and that's going to be applied. It's a fixed, uh, it's a fixed force. And it will be applied in a particular direction for a certain amount of time, which we call the running time. And then after that time has elapsed, the particle will pick a new random direction and run once again at that same force. Uh, so what I'll be showing, we have a delta distribution of how long they spend running, but the clocks of all the particles have been randomized. So they don't all tumble at the same time. That doesn't really change the physics, but it makes the movies look really weird. So each particle has a little clock keeping track of how long it's been running in a particular direction. Then this is um, this is this is the motor force. Then we have an interaction force. So we treat these as almost hard spheres. They're not truly hard. They have a very stiff spring, so they don't know about each other until they get very close together, and then they repel each other quite strongly. So there's almost no overlap of their positions. Um, and then we can have obstacles present. So what I'll show here will be um, well, I'll show a couple of different kinds, but mostly it'll be just particles that we've taken and nailed down so they can't move. So essentially it's the same hard sphere interaction as with a moving particle. And then we can apply a drift force. So that would be simply taking our entire system and tilting it in one direction. So all the particles are sliding, say to the right, for example. So if I can commence this movie to play, there's a, uh, well, uh, nope, doesn't look like I can commence it to with everything on my screen here. Uh, there we go. Okay. Well, play for a second. All right. At any rate, if we run this simulation, we wind up getting uh, what other people have seen, which is the formation of large dense clusters surrounded by uh, dilute gas. Now, this had been studied quite a bit already, so we started asking what happens if you put obstacles in there. And so one of the first things we tried was adding a pair of walls to the system. And uh, looking at what ha what that does to this um, motility-induced phase separation state. So of course, what happens is that these walls serve as nucleation sites for the formation of these dense clusters. So even if you're at a density overall below where you would see these clusters, the clusters will nucleate the walls and then um, start moving. This is the, the case where the particles have interactions with each other. If they don't interact with each other, but only interact with the walls, you'll find that they are actually pressing the walls together. So this is a fairly dense limit, but if we go even to the dilute limit where they don't form the clusters, you wind up getting a force pushing the two walls towards each other because the particles are more likely to arrive from the outside of the walls than from the inside of the walls. So that gives you the imbalance. And um, this can be mapped to the Casimir effect that's known from more fundamental physics. And the idea there is if you have two metal plates that are quite close together and these distances are very small for actual Casimir effect, you have vacuum fluctuations in the electromagnetic field on all sides of the plates. But between the plates, uh, the longer wavelengths of those fluctuations are cut off. And so there's not as many fluctuations on the inside as on the outside. So you wind up with a net force pushing these plates together. This is the origin of the van der Waals attraction that you're probably familiar with from more atomistic systems. So the idea is that the active systems can actually give a similar pressing in of the plates due to their own fluctuations. It's a different type of mechanism, but interestingly, it happens on a lot larger scale. So as I mentioned, for a traditional Casimir, these plates have to be really close together, but for active systems, they can be quite far apart. And so uh, the Volpe's group tried this with their little hexabugs and uh, so here is it. Here they allowed their plates to move, and what you see is that the hexabugs can, in fact, get these plates to come together. So this is the, the hexabug Casimir effect, the active Casimir effect. Now, eventually, they won't bring the plates completely together here. They speed up the movie, so it doesn't take quite so long. Uh, you wind up getting the plates pretty much parallel, and then occasionally a hexabug will run in between them. But uh, so you have kind of a little bit of a fluctuation of your of your state. 
So what's interesting here is it suggests that there may be other places where you can draw analogies from much more fundamental physics or hard condensed matter physics and apply it to the active matter system. So our next question was, well, what if we don't have walls? What if we have posts? And uh, so instead of having these lines of obstacles, we're going to just take individual obstacles, nail them down, and then let the active particles swim around. And then we'll do this both for the, the particles simply swimming on their own, but then I'll also show briefly what happens if we take the whole system and tilt it to one side. And the reason that we do that is to help see what, uh, to help elucidate some of the physics that we're finding. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that this type of substrate can be made. It can be done optically. You can use actual posts. Uh, you can also use divots so that it's places where the particles get a bit stuck. Here we, we focus specifically on posts, but we've also done the divot type. Now, one of the things that is known from condensed matter physics, if you have some kind of substrate, um, you can have the substrate be random or you can have it be periodic. And if it's periodic, you can have commensuration effects occur where you have some some uh, length scale for the interaction between your particles that are moving around and some other length scale between your substrate, which might be posts or it might be atoms or something like that. Uh, so here's just sort of a an image. This is supposed to be an optical substrate trapping some colloidal particles. And you can see that there is a uh, periodic array of these divots. And then the, the particles have fallen into the divots. And you have a few places where there's a particle missing. So we're a little bit away from having a matching where we've got one particle for dip, per divot. If we're right at one particle per divot and we take the whole thing and tip it, it has a hard time moving. This is what is known as a Mott phase in condensed matter, where if you have your electrons exactly matching your substrate, they are very difficult to move. It becomes an insulating state. But if you move just a little bit away from that, if I take a few of these particles away, I have missing particles, or I can do the other way and have some extras. Those missing particles are extremely mobile compared to the rest of the particles, they'll start moving around first. And so you can go from an insulating state right at matching to a conducting state where the conduction is occurring by the motion of either these are essentially holes or missing particles or else interstitials. And uh, so you see very strong effects in the transport. And then you can also see very strong effects in the way that this system arranges if you are at, uh, say, below matching, you can get different lattices or above matching. Um, and so there's a lot of effects that are known from condensed matter. So we were interested in taking some of these types of effects and looking for them in active matter. So what we wanted to do is put our posts down in a periodic array. So rather than random, we have periodic posts. And here we are changing. We can either change the spacing between the posts or we can change how big the posts are. And so the first thing that we did, that's the post of the red here, is we took just one active particle and sent it through the post to see what would happen. So if we have a small running length, that's essentially a diffusing particle. And what you would expect if you put a diffusing particle in a post array, it ought to just diffuse. There should be no characteristic direction of the motion. And that's exactly what we see. It just kind of diffuses around. Um, it, it'll spend a little time trapped in between some of these posts, and then it'll move out, and it'll keep going. If we increase the uh, running time so that it's quite long, we see a different behavior where the particle will lock to one of the symmetry directions of the array. So if it starts to run at a direction that's more or less aligned with one of the channels, it will follow that channel. And if it's not perfectly aligned, it'll actually get hit into the channel. So it'll almost try to get it out. And then it'll bash into a post, which will push it back into the channel. So this gives a locking effect, meaning that even if it's for a range of angles, it will follow one angle through the, through the array. And then there's a series of these angles. Obviously, there's the, um, the major symmetry direction. And then there can be um, different angles. There can be low angles. Uh, there's going to be the primary symmetry directions. And then there'll be smaller ones. If we change the running length and make it not quite so long, we get kind of a mix of the behavior. So that instead of seeing these very long periods of locking of the motion, the, the particle will be diffusive over long times. So, so at short times, it looks like it's following a particular direction, but over long times, it looks a lot more like if you had the small running length, it's just diffusing it in all possible directions eventually. If you increase the spacing between the posts, um, then you go back to the diffusive behavior. And this is just because 
uh, the thing that's causing the particle to lock in these directions of motion is the fact that it's bashing into the posts. So if you make it so that it hardly ever hits a post, then it will no longer be able to lock and you'll go back to just more or less regular active matter behavior without the locking. So this, so you can see this if you look at the direction of motion of the particle as a function of time, is in the absence of an external drive, it is locking itself to different symmetry directions of the, the posts. And here you can see for the large running length, this is the average velocity in the x direction. These are the different symmetry directions. And if we have small running lengths, instead you get just a, uh, a, broad, a uh, Gaussian distribution of the velocities in the x direction. Um, and this type of motion has been seen already uh, quite a while ago by Volpe et al, who sent um, bacteria through these little posts. And they were able to see that you could get a channeling motion depending on how um, how long the uh, how how long the uh, the correlation time of the running was for that system. All right, now let's take a look at a couple different examples, and then I think I should speed up a little, so I'll show you my movies and come to my conclusion. Um, as I said, if you make the posts really small, you essentially just go back to the behavior you would have if you didn't have posts. So here we have essentially an active liquid state. The posts are tiny. They're these little red dots, so they're really not able to cause this locking behavior. Um, if you go to a larger obstacle radius, um, now we are able to get a bit of the locking motion. But the other thing you can see is that the particles are trying to make their active state, or they're trying to make the MIPS cluster, and they're trying to fit their MIPS cluster in between the posts. But the spacing of the particles doesn't quite match the spacing between the posts. So they can only make a disordered arrangement of particles in between these posts. If we didn't have the posts, they would actually try to make a triangular um, lattice in, in our model. So they wind up being kind of fluidized by the fact that they don't quite fit in between the posts. If we go to uh, make the obstacles a little bit bigger, let me get to the next movie here. Now they do match. The, the spacing of the, the particles and the spacing of the posts does match. And now we get this crystalline state. So they're able to make this MIPS type cluster and it fits inside the posts. So the whole thing is completely locked. And you can wind up with, it's actually much more stable than a normal MIPS cluster would be. And so you only get a little bit of motion at the edges. Occasionally, you'll get a disturbance through the whole thing. So this is a commensuration type effect that you can see in condensed matter. And finally, if we make the posts huge, uh, now we're almost back to just pure clogging. So the particles are mostly stuck. And then they can occasionally have little movements as they try to escape from one of these traps between the particles to another. Um, in that case, we wind up getting much more avalanche-like behavior. So if it was active particles, we get um, occasionally a few break free and move out, and you get a broad distribution of velocities. But if they are uh, just run and tumble, you wind, or no, sorry, if the running time is really short, you wind up with um, thermalized motion. And then you have, um, then you have um, more of a Lorentzian distribution of the velocities. <clears throat> Oops. All right. So this is just kind of summarizing what I showed. If we have a small correlation time or running time, we wind up with a thermal fluid. So the particles are just flowing around in between the posts. If we have uh, the spacing between the particles doesn't quite match the spacing between the posts, we get a frustrated state where they try to make the ribs cluster, but it can only form on small scales. And the whole thing winds up being rather fluidized. If the spacing does match, we get this active MOT phase where they lock really well. Um, this has transport property implications that I really don't have time to show you in this talk, but you could ask me later. And then if the posts are tiny, we just have a, an active fluid. So of course here, they're able to still kind of do their MIPS clustering because the running time is long. Here, the running time was short. So that's the difference between the thermal and the active fluid. <laughs> and this is just zooming in a bit more on these ordered crystal states that can form which state forms depends on exactly the ratio of the size of the particles to the spacing in between the obstacles. Here you get a little triangular lattice forming. Down here you actually get a rotated square lattice that forms. Um, and then you can even get interesting states if the posts are tiny, but there is matching, you can, you can pin the whole thing this way. Um, so there's a quite rich physics here. Now the direction of drive does make a difference. Um, if we now do some transport, 
if we push the particles along the one of the symmetry directions of the array, you already know they like to run along that direction because I showed you that with a single particle. If they're non-active, so we have a super short running time, they'll just flow right along the channels. They'll make 1D channel formation. If we start to increase the running length, they will somewhat come out of these 1D channels and they'll flow more as a uniform liquid. But if we keep increasing the running length, what happens is they start to form their active clusters or MIPS clusters, and that interferes with their ability to move through the array. So we get this active clustering state and the, the uh, if we measure the velocity moving through the array, it goes down. And eventually, if we make the running length long enough, they will be so busy trying to run in the direction they want to run that they will clog completely and we'll get almost no motion. This is actually back to that avalanche type motion that I showed before. So we call this an active clogged state. And so if you look at the mobility, it as a function of running length, it's high if they're essentially thermal, and then it goes down and reaches almost zero as we enter the clogged state. And the fraction of the particles that have formed a cluster goes from almost zero when the activity is low to almost all of them are in a cluster as you go to high activities. Now, if we rotate the direction of drive and instead of going along zero, we go along 35 degrees, we see something different, which is that if the running length is small, nothing moves. And then if we increase the running length, everything starts to move. And then if we keep increasing the running length, everything stops moving again. So what we're seeing here is a transition between, we still have the active clogged state at the high running lengths. We still have this active fluid at intermediate running lengths, but at small running lengths, we have what we call a thermally clogged state. And you can see that here, which is that by driving at 35 degrees, the particles cannot manage to follow the easy flow channel. It's just exactly, we know this from work we had done previously. We know that at that drive, they will bash into posts too often and they will all get stuck behind the posts. So this is a thermally clogged state. Um, then that's followed by, if we increase the running time, they can get out of those stuck places and form a uniform liquid. But then if we keep increasing the running length, they start to cluster again. And finally they spend all their time clustering. So we go from a thermally clogged state, which you can see is, is produced by purely by the drive to an active clogged state, which is produced by the particles themselves and a little bit by the drive. And so uh, as a result, if we look at a phase diagram as a function of run length and the total density of the system, we see this thermally clogged state only when we have enough particles. We have to have a high enough density and then we can get the thermal clogging. Then if we raise the running length, that goes away. But if we raise it enough, we get this active clog state and notice that it goes down to much lower densities than the thermal clock state. In fact, we don't think that this ends. We think if we keep increasing the running length, this keeps dropping to lower density, but we only had this much patience uh, for our running length for these simulations. So this is a distinctively different state. And another way that you can see that difference is if you look at finite size effects and you ask, what is the fraction of particles that are in a cluster for these two different states as I make the whole system bigger? So if it is the, uh, the non-active limit, so this thermally clogged state, the fraction of particles that are in the, the cluster that's stuck is essentially constant. But if I'm in the actively clogged state, the fraction of particles that are in this, um, this stuck cluster is dropping as I increase the system size. And what that looks like physically is if I have a thermally clogged state, it has to percolate. It can't clog unless it is able to cross all the way from one side of the system to the other, because the only thing that's holding it stuck is the fact that the particles are in contact with each other. And so if they can't bridge all the way across the system, they will not be stuck. But the active particles are not being clogged by the drive, they're being clogged by themselves. And so they don't have to span the system. They can make a little cluster all by themselves and that will stop the motion. So here's a higher density of the active clogged state uh, but then here is a lower density, which would not thermally clog, but it does actively clog. And you see it's just forming patches that are stuck. It doesn't have to go across the system. All right, so just wrapping up some examples of experiments that can be done. I already showed you some of the work from Volpe's group sending active particles through arrays and seeing this locking. But there's been more recent work um, of sending um, particles through arrays and seeing that uh, if the particles are being driven at some angle to the array symmetry direction, once they hit the array, they lock into the symmetry angle of the array itself. And then there's also some work uh, where people are considering what happens if you have 
differing densities of these arrays, because as I said, the spacing between the particles matters. So you can actually get separation of these active particles if you put them in an array with um, different spacing as a function of, of, uh, of location. Um, you can also think about expanding to three dimensions. So there's been beautiful work out of Princeton on these um, hydrogel where you can have bacteria running around inside the hydrogel. And you could ask, well, what if I had uh, this MOT phase, but in three dimensions? That does exist in condensed matter. And you could try it for active matter with a system like this. Um, you can also look at it with uh, flocking systems. So these are the Kinke rollers that the Bartolo group has looked at, where you can get kind of a combing of your flocking state if you add the, uh, the, the quench disorder. And then just a final idea is uh, what happens if you have non-reciprocal interactions or these uh, odd viscosity type interactions and you imagine having chiral or flocking motions, what would happen to these MOT type blocking states that I've shown if you had this type of system? Because now you've got another essentially length scale to add. Uh, and that could start looking similar to if you have electrons in a crystalline lattice in the presence of a magnetic field. That's actually a very hot topic right now in, in hard condensed matter. So just to summarize, uh, if we have one active particle, you can get it to directionally lock when it's translating through a periodic obstacle array. Uh, I showed you that you can have MOT physics where you've got a locking. If there's a matching between the spacing of your active particles and the spacing between posts in a periodic array and it can cause crystallization and it can block the transport. Yeah. Um, or, Wait. Say, okay, Wait. Let, me, let me just finish my uh, my summary and then I'll do questions here. Um, so you can get collective effects, either a thermally or actively clogged state. And that thermally clogged state is purely caused by the drive and it has to span the system. But the active clogging is caused by the activity and it does not have to span the system to form.